Do you remember what it was like to play with blocks when you were a little kid? Some, some of you can't remember that far back. Okay. Do you remember what it was like when your kids played with blocks? Or have you seen little children playing with blocks at any point in your life? Yes, everybody has seen a kid building with blocks. Ever see a kid only build a, a tower two blocks high? No. What do they want to do? They want to build it as high as they possibly can. If they're anything like my boys, they will use every block or piece of equipment in the house to build a tower. But what inevitably happens when it gets too high? It falls down. Now, it's a good thing that we don't let children write books on architecture, isn't it? But crashing blocks give a great opportunity for a life lesson. First, if you want to build a high tower, you need a good foundation. You don't just start with one narrow skinny block and then try and just stack them up on top of that. You need to go a little bit wide and make sure it's stable so that your foundation gives you the best chance of having a solid structure. But that's not all. Another reason the blocks fall down is because there's nothing holding them together. You see, real architects and grown-up builders plan for mortar, nails, and screws to hold together the brick, stone, and wood that they use for making things. Couple a strong connection with a solid foundation, and you're well on your way to building a structure that will go high and will last. Our current teaching series, Jesus is Lord of All, is about building our ecclesiology, our philosophy of what the church is all about. And what we are all about at City Center, this particular church in this particular place, we're building on the foundation of Jesus as Lord. You remember the diagram that Pastor Derek put up a couple of weeks ago and has been working through. Jesus is Lord is our foundation with the roof over our heads that contains our mission and vision, shaping everything that we do to go and make disciples. Pastor Derek is in the midst of teaching on our five priorities, represented by the five pillars, and we have them here on our platform to remind us that these are the things that are important to us. They give us shape. They define how we will work out the mission and vision that God has called us to. But if you notice in the diagram, there are connecting words between the pillars. Those words in red define the relationships between the priorities. I like to think of them as the mortar that stick the pillars together so that they keep their structure and don't fall away from one another. So Derek has asked me this morning to talk a little bit about the biblical foundation for these connecting points, this mortar that glues together the pillars. These are the principles that connect our priorities. The principles that connect our priorities. And to find them, I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. With today as our 37th anniversary, 37 years serving God together, there could be no better time to be in the heart of a series of what it means to be the church, what it means to be this church. Because Christian living is living as the church. So the priorities that we share, we share in both our individual walk and with the walk that God has called us to in community, which is the church. Peter talks about this in chapter 2 of his first letter. If you found it, I want to start reading at verse 9 and continue all the way down to verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, this is God's word to us. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. 
Keep your con conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I love studying Peter on the subject of Christian living. You remember just a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to participate in our summer series of how we honor our country while maintaining allegiance to God, true patriot love. I took a few messages to, to uh, unpack the teaching of Peter and the life of Peter, the actions of Peter on submission to authorities and how we behave in those kinds of situations. So I really appreciate studying Peter on the subject of Christian living. It's not taking anything away from Paul. There's certainly great harmony between their teaching. But Peter actually did live with Jesus, didn't he? He spent three years every day with the one like whom we are supposed to live. Peter was also a leader. He was part of Jesus' inner circle and arguably the leading voice, if not the loudest voice, of the disciples. Finally, though... Peter was a mere man, and by that I mean perhaps more than any of the other disciples. Peter exemplified what it is like to fail at the Christian walk and receive the grace of Christ and persevere to follow him. This can be an encouragement to us. That's why I like to study Peter when it comes to Christian living. And this is a well-known passage on Christian living. And in fact, it contains all four principles that connect our priorities as a church. The first is the principle of identity. I remember years ago hearing Ravi Zacharias tell this story about a man who had fallen on hard times. And he was out of work, couldn't find a job anywhere in his field, but he had a family to feed. And it was a hot summer, very much like the September that we just came through, a heat wave that was stifling the, the city, and his air conditioning unit had broken down, so he become more and more desperate to find some sort of work so that he would have the money to fix it and take care of his family. And so that man ended up answering a want ad for a job at the zoo. And he went to the zoo, and the zookeeper hired him on the spot, said, you can start today. So the man agreed. The zookeeper turned around and handed him an orangutan costume and told him to put it on. So the man put it on. You see, the heat had caused the animals to be sluggish, and they were staying inside, and so there was nothing for the people to see when they came by the exhibits. So the zookeeper said to the man, all you have to do is put on this costume, go into this pen over here, swing around on the trees, eat bananas, and grunt a little bit when the children come up to the fence. So swallowing his pride... The man did just that to make a few bucks. But by the end of the day, the heat was getting more intense and he was sweltering inside this heavy orangutan costume. And while he was swinging on a branch, he lost his concentration and swung over the fence into the lion's den. And the lion was sitting right over there by the rocks and the man started screaming and waving his hands all over the place. And the lion looked at him and said, if you don't shut up, we're both gonna lose our jobs. <laughs> Identity. Who are you? Who is the person sitting beside you? Peter has a lot to say about the Christian identity and who you are. And who you are has everything to do with Jesus Christ. He hasn't given you a costume to put on. He has made you who you are. He has defined your identity, and what is that? I want you to write down these four words. For each principle, I'm going to give you four words that come out of the text that reinforce that principle. For the principle of identity, write these words down. They're in the passage. Chosen, royal, holy, possession. Maybe you want to underline them in your Bible if you like to mark it up. Chosen, royal, holy, Possession. All of these words are found right in verse 9. And if you are in Christ, says Peter, if you have made him Lord of your life, then this is your identity. You are chosen. God looked into time before time began and saw you. 
He knew everything about you before you were even conceived. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And you might say, well, that was God appointing the prophet Jer Jeremiah. He's just appointing him, but I would say no. Look at Paul writing to the Galatians. He reads this language onto his own calling when he says, but God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. David echoes saying, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You are chosen. You are special. You matter to God. And he loves you no matter where you've come from or what you've done. Because he saw it all before and he, he chose you anyways. He loved you anyways. No matter how horrible your past is, God looks and invites you and says, find rest, my child. My love is stronger than anything in the universe. You are chosen. You are royal. The child of a king. The new life in Christ that he gives you, gives you standing as a joint heir with Christ in the riches of the kingdom of God. You share an inheritance with the one who is seated at the right hand of God. You see, Peter, in defining the identity of the Christian, is using language in this passage that draws a parallel to God's chosen people in the old covenant, the nation of Israel. He's framing the church as such. So when John, in his magnificent prologue, pronounces that to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's John 1, verse 12. Then Paul can turn around in Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 and say, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs, fellow heirs with Christ. Then he says to the Galatians, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, according to the promise, the same promise that was made to the nation of Israel. That's Galatians 3.29. So Peter can take all that and proclaim in chapter 1 and verse 4 of this letter that you are born into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. If you are in Christ, you are a child of the king. That is part of your identity. You are also holy. What does holy mean? You know that it means set apart. God has set you apart for his own purpose, cleansed you, purified you, dignified you. You are his treasured possession. That's the fourth word of identity. You are God's possession. So just as David says of the Israelites, we are his people the sheep of his pasture, the New Testament Christian reads and participates in that text because we belong to Christ. If 1 Corinthians 3.23, if Galatians 5.24 have anything to say about it, I love how John puts it in 1 John chapter 4. My dear children, he says, you belong to God. If all that is true, if this really is who we are in Christ, if this really is our identity, what does that mean for us today? Well, the first thing it means is that if you have not yet made Jesus Lord of all in your life, this is what's available to you. If you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus and asked him to save you from the darkness of your sin and failure and shame, this is what is waiting for you a new identity, a new name, a new nature, a new home. Today can be the day when everything changes for you. But if you do belong to Christ, how does this principle of identity connect our priorities? If we look back at the illustration of our MVP and just put it up for a minute, you'll see that identity connects knowing and worshiping. What does that mean? The world wants to tell you that what you do determines who you are. We want to define ourselves by our accomplishments, by our achievements, by our job, by our earning potential, by our fame. That is all an illusion. 
God tells us that who you are determines what you do, what you are for. And if this identity, chosen, royal, holy, and possession, is what comes from knowing God, the only possible response is worship. The only rational thing to do is to then pour back everything that we have and everything that we are to God to whom we owe everything at all. So identity is what connects knowing Christ to worshiping him as Lord because we understand who we are, who God is, and who we are in relationship to him, that we owe everything to him. But there is a second principle. It's character. Character, says Os Guinness, is what we do when no one sees. It's the content, morally, of our personality. It's the integrity between what we say and what we do. Our character is, in fact, what the Holy Spirit can work on to make us more like Christ. Sir Thomas More was a 15th century English statesman who served as Lord Chancellor of England and counselor to King Henry VIII. His character is the subject of the well-known play by Robert Bolt, A Man for All Seasons, which many of us, including me, studied in high school. It tells of how Moore refused to endorse the annulment of the king's marriage so that he could marry his mistress, and how he refused to take an oath, declaring the king to be the supreme head of the Church of England so that he could force the annulment himself. Moore wouldn't stand for it, wouldn't have it, But he did so without publicly admonishing the king. And he walked a very fine and tenuous line. And his silence, along with the incredible courage of his moral conviction, earned him that title, a man for all seasons. That's character. The shaping of character seems to be a bit of a lost art today, possibly because of the lack of any real convictions to be courageous about. That comes, of course, from the absence of a foundation to build blocks upon. Our foundation is absent in our schools, in our public institution, so there's nowhere to go when we decide we want to start shaping character. Well, what do we shape it towards? That's a tangent. For Peter, however, he talks about and instructs the character of the Christian. So when it comes to character, you can write down these four words. They're all in the text. These four phrases, or circle them in your Bible. Abstain, wage war, your conduct spoken against. Abstain, wage war, your conduct spoken against. They all have to do with our character. When Peter exhorts us to abstain, from the passions of the flesh in verse 11. He picks up the very common biblical theme of trading the old nature for the new. In Romans 13, Paul tells us to cast off the works of darkness so that we can put on Christ, making no provision for the desires of the flesh. It's the same principle. From Jesus turning the morality code upside down in the Sermon on the Mount, to the fruit of the Spirit in Paul's letter to the Galatians, the Bible teaches what character is and then shows us the only way to achieve it is by being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So Peter goes a step further by pointing out the war that is going on in your soul. It's a war. It's a battleground. It's dirty. It's messy. It's violent. It makes the pursuit of character a little less romantic, doesn't it? But I can relate to that. What about you? Can you relate to a war going on in your soul? You ever feel like there's a battle in your mind for how you'll respond to a pressure situation? You ever feel the pull back and forth between patience and lashing out at your your kids? Between chiming in and walking away from that rude conversation at the office? between humble transparency or a defensive jab when you can take it in an argument with your spouse? Peter says, keep your conduct honorable. Your conduct 
honorable. Guard your character so that if someone calls you an evildoer, and they will, you will be called an evildoer because you follow Christ, because you belong to Christ. You will be tested and persecuted, even vilified at times. They will say of you, your God does not belong in the school, does not belong in the public square. Neither do you. Your voice should be silenced when all the other voices have an opportunity to speak because what you're saying is evil, even hateful. When someone calls you an evildoer, remember Peter was writing to, to the displaced Christians across the Roman Empire who were just about ready to go into a serious bout of persecution. Nero, the emperor, was getting ready to put the grips to the Christians in a way they had not yet seen. You might face displacement, disparagement, discouragement. Someone might label you an evildoer, but you will be vindicated by your character if your character conforms to the character of Christ. Now, how does that translate into our priorities? Well, character is the connection between worshiping and growing. How so? Here's one way. If we have integrity between what we say we believe and how we live, then it will be a priority for us to go deeper with Jesus. That's what we'll want to do necessarily. What do I mean? I mean if our worship here on Sunday is authentic, if we mean what we proclaim when we come together and sing, you guys sang beautifully this morning. It was fantastic. I don't often get to hear that sitting in your midst. I can hear every one of you singing. That was amazing. If we mean what we are singing, if our commitment to be a disciple and live the life of worship is consistent, then we will prioritize growing in our relationship with Christ and we will do the things he taught us to do to allow the Holy Spirit to have access to our hearts and shape us to be more like him. We'll spend time in his word. We'll study the teaching. We'll meditate on the truth. We'll talk to him, open our hearts in prayer. We'll discipline ourselves with quiet times of reflection. And in a, a blessed upward spiral, in a positive feedback circle, we will realize that the only way to develop our character is to grow in Christ. That's how worship leads to growth. And those two pillars stick together. So what about relationship, the third connector? Time's getting short. Here are the four relationship words. Race, a priesthood, a nation, a people. A race, a priesthood, a nation, a people. We're back up in verse 9 again. Lots could be said about each one of those things that Peter uses to describe believers. We could go back to the nation of Israel. We could unpack the role of the priest in the Old Testament and what it means under the new covenant in Christ's blood for us to be, have, be a priesthood of believers. But all I want to do this morning is to show you that the Christian walk is a walk of relationship. Why? Because as Paul addresses the people, he addresses them as a group. Each one of those words represents a group. A race, a priesthood, a nation, a people. In fact, the corporate language in verse 9, each is linked to an identity statement. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. What Peter is saying is that the Christian walk is not a walk by yourself. It's meant to happen in community. It's meant to happen with other people. That's why 1 John 4.20 says, you cannot love God and hate your brother. You cannot make Christian living merely a private affair. Yes, God requires salvation at the level of the individual. Yes, he requires us to develop our relationship with him. But the call of God is into the church. It's into the community of the church. It's into the nation. It's into the race. It's into the priesthood to become a people of his own possession. I was really honored yesterday to be at a wedding of two really cool young people who were on fire for the Lord. Sarah and Matthew were married here. 
The song they chose for the processional was A Thousand Years. It's a love song. It's a song of a man singing to his bride, I'll love you for a thousand years and a thousand more. It was cool. I saw that love in them. They were, they were wholly sold out. As I was playing that song for Sarah, as the beautiful bride was walking down the aisle, it occurred to me that the true marriage that will last a thousand years and a thousand more and a thousand more after that is the marriage of Christ to his bride that the scriptures describe. Nowhere in the scriptures does it describe you individually as the bride of Christ. The bride is the church. It's the group. That's what Peter is trying to get across in our text. That your Christian journey is not a solo motorbike ride across the Rocky Mountains. Apologies to Annie and Francis. They ride motorbikes. It's a bus tour on the highway to heaven. It is a group event. In fact, that's what connects growing to serving. Because if we are growing closer to God, if we are going deeper with him together, it will show in how we care for one another, how we love one another, and how we serve one another. In fact, I don't think it's a stretch to say that serving in the church is primarily oriented towards those in the church. This is not to discount evangelism and outreach. We're getting to there in just a minute. That is our mission. We're going to get there. But equipping the saints is logically prior to sending them out. And it isn't interesting that Paul, in his charge to the Ephesians in chapter 4, points out that the apostles and the prophets and the shepherds and the teachers, yes, even the evangelists, are given to the community of the church to equip the saints, that is the group, to do the work of ministry for the building up of the church, the building up of the group itself, until we all attain the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, Ephesians 4 verse 11. Relationship connects growing to serving. And if we are growing in Christ, we will build one another up, which is building up the church, which is the corporate nature of this whole endeavor that we have embarked on called discipleship. There's so much more that could be said about that. Time is getting away from us, so let me move to the final connector, which is mission. Mission is the final connector, and it connects serving to reaching the lost. So we serve one another to build up the body of Christ, which is the church, and then we send out the members to reach the lost at home and abroad, which is fueled by our mission given by Christ himself. Here are the four mission words in our text. Proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. That's evangelism. Proclaim. Then sojourners, we are on the move. We are traveling to our destination, inviting the poor and disenfranchised and wayward to come along with us and be refreshed, even transformed as we have been. We are sojourners on the move. Exiles, number three, exiles. We're not at home here. Our home is yet to come in glory, yet still we speak the name of Jesus. We are exiled yet still faithful to him. And finally, see your good deeds. See your good deeds. That's in verse 12. Never underestimate the testimony your life can have in the life of someone else who desperately needs a savior. God can use you by the power of his spirit to speak to the lost and convict their hearts. It's his work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to change hearts. You can't do that. I can't do that but he wants to use us for his great purpose. Are you making yourself available to him for that purpose? You remember the tremendous success of Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, a few years ago. Why was that? Was there some profound theological advance contained within its pages deep in the last chapter? No. It was a simple book. But Rick Warren reminded believers that their life is their mission. 
and called seekers to a purpose beyond and outside of merely themselves. A purpose designed by God. A purpose for the glory of God. See, mission connects the church with the world. It connects serving, which is the equipping of the saints in the church, with reaching, which is the work of the saints outside the church. That's what we're equipping each other for. And when the lost are reached, the circle continues. When the lost are reached, what happens? They come to know Christ. And in knowing him, they discover a new identity. And it continues. Where does all that leave us? Well, it's our anniversary. How do you like to celebrate your anniversary? Any anniversary. It doesn't have to be a wedding. Some people like to gather around a table and break bread. We're going to do that in just a minute. Some people like to spend a moment remembering the milestones and the victories of the past. We're going to do that, especially the victory of what Christ has done for us. Some married couples like to renew their vows, don't they? In our bedroom, Elizabeth and I have a large portrait on our wall of us standing together in the midst of a vast landscape. We're small, and God's creation is big. And around, engraved around the frame of that photo, I might have said this before, are our wedding vows. So we get to look at them every day. I get to remember every day what I have vowed and committed to her. But it also encourages me to know what she has committed to me. I love that portrait. See, Jesus made a new covenant with us when he broke bread at the final Passover celebration and sealed it with his blood. The promise of that covenant is the promise to us. He promises to give us a new identity when we become a part of that covenant. He promises to shape our character by writing his word on our hearts like it was prophesied in the Old Testament, writing his word on our very hearts so that we become like him. We don't need to conform to a code of 100,000 different laws. We become the code. He promises to place us in covenant community relationship called the church where our brothers and sisters in him, walk together and build one another up. And he sends us on a mission and promises to be with us. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Today is a great day to renew our commitment to Jesus and celebrate his promise to us. But if you're not in covenant with him, you can be today if you'll trust him as the Lord of your life and the Lord of all. Let's pray together. Almighty God, sovereign over all the universe, yet Lord over each individual heart that trusts you, Thank you for the power of your holy word, for the instruction it brings, and the transformation by your spirit that it un un reveals in each of us. Would you please, by your grace, continue conforming us to the image of Christ so that we can follow after him and participate in your kingdom. For his great name's sake, we pray. Amen.